The second talk will be by Diallo Sadu, uh, whose um, PhD is in governance and regional integration from the Pan-African University in, in Yonde, Cameroon. Um, and the title of that talk will be Early Climate Shocks and Later Life and Later Human Capital Accumulation in Urban and Rural Sub-Saharan Africa, Effects on School Attendance and Educational Attainment. Then we'll have two talks in the room, first by Wen Vong, uh, a PhD candidate in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The title of that talk will be The Long Run Effects of Defoliating Vietnam. And finally, Ercio Munoz will present, uh, Ercio, sorry, is an economist um, at the Gender and Diversity Division of the Inter-American Development Bank. And Ercio's talk will be, Does It Matter Where You Grow Up? Childhood Exposure Effects in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so if the technology works well, we should be hearing first from JD. So thank you so much for um, for having me. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, hope to, but uh, wasn't feeling well. And so I didn't want to travel and get um, all of you sick. Um, okay, so this is joint work with uh, Eduardo Montero, who's at the um, University of Chicago. Uh, and we're looking at... Um, or the starting point for this paper is that you know we're both very interested in Latin America, which um, I guess I'll give you like a, a three sentence introduction to the entire region if you're not familiar with it. But it's a it's middle income region, um, very high rates of uh, inequality, um, and there's a, a large racial element to those disparities. Basically, the the darker your skin color, uh, the more likely it is that um, that you are um, on the lower end of that income distribution. Also in Latin America is, uh, and in fact, kind of only in Latin America is this disease called Chagas disease. Um, uh, almost every single case is in the region, about six to 8 million people today uh, are infected with the parasite that causes Chagas disease. Um, and it's it's one of the high, even though it's you know a relatively small fraction of people who have it, um, it's a very high burden infectious disease um, for the region. And I'll explain more uh, specifically what the disease is in a moment. But um, there's this famous and somewhat controversial author in Latin America, uh, Eduardo Galeano, who um, wrote a, a poem about Chagas disease. And, and you can read it, but basically, yeah, basically, 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 this is a disease that um, is very much a, a disease of, of the poor. Only the poorest people get it, uh, and it, it's really quite a, a terrible disease. So, um, you know, to kind of motivate things empirically, what we can do is look at um, the, the environmental suitability at the country level um, for the, the main vector of Chagas disease. This is, it's not the mosquito, it's, it's a different type of bug. Um, and so you can see kind of in, um, you know, the, in, in Brazil and, and sort of Northern, South America are the um, the countries with the highest uh, rates of, of suitability for these bugs. When we look at GDP per capita, so basically a measure of income, um, you know, there's there's some decent correlation between Chagas suitability and um, and income, but you really see it in terms of inequality and in the Gini coefficient. That you know, Brazil has the highest Gini coefficient and, and one of the highest rates of um, Chagas suitability. So, you know, we think the, the natural question here is basically, you know, is, is, is this disease that's only in Latin America causing some of these sort of very specific Latin American problems, uh, you know, in terms of racial disparities and underdevelopment? And then, um, you know, we think it, it may have some, some broader effects as well. So that's what we'll be exploring in this paper. Okay, so let me tell you a, a bit about Chagas disease. This is kind of this complex phase diagram, so, so let me sort of break it down. Um, these uh, bugs called uh, triatamine bugs um, are the, the main source of exposure to the, the parasite that causes Chagas. Um, these bugs primarily live in the cracks and roofs and walls. So if you are living in a house made of, of mud or with a thatched roof, basically, if you're more likely to live in poor housing, you're more likely to be exposed to this, um, to this bug and therefore the parasite. So um, shortly after being infected with the parasite, you're going to experience one to three months of, of very nonspecific symptoms, but like, you know, you're going to feel pretty crummy for a while. You'll have fever, malaise. So it's it's possible that, you know, this um, disease may affect, um, you know, the ability of, of for example, of, of children to go to school. Um, 
Then in a large share of those who are infected, um, the, the parasite goes dormant for about 10, uh, there are no symptoms really for 10 to sometimes up to 30 years. Uh, and then um, for, for um, a large share of these, these individuals, um, the disease enters what's called the chronic phase. And in Brazil, uh, where, where we're looking particularly, uh, this is going to involve um, the, the heart muscle basically um, weakening and, and being replaced a lot with scar tissue. So you effectively have a heart that, that uh, loses strength over time and, and loses its ability to pump blood through the body. Um, obviously, that's going to affect you know, adults' ability to work. Um, also, cardiovascular care is incredibly expensive, uh, one of the more expensive forms of, of, of health and hospital care. Um, so you know, we think that if this disease is going away, we, we may see um, you know, heart, uh, cardiovascular, circulatory disease outcomes uh, changing as well. Okay, so um, we did that sort of cross-country correlation at the beginning. Uh, we're going to use some quasi-experimental, um, uh, a quasi-experimental strategy within Brazil to kind of get at these answers, at these questions, sort of more in a, in a causal way. So Brazil, um, in the mid 1970s through the early 1980s, did a nationwide survey um, of its municipalities, uh, look going around and, and um, searching villages. Um, this is predominantly rural areas, searching villages for the presence of this main vector. Uh, and then in 1984, it began uh, spraying an insecticide that uh, is strong enough to kill the vector and, and um, was kind of cost effective enough to do this nationwide. So this isn't the prettiest scanned map, but um, we can look at, uh, they did you know, a follow-up survey in 1989. And you can see that you know, there's a lot less shaded area. Um, so we take those, you know, municipalities that were shaded in, in 75 to 83, and then are no longer shaded in 1989. Those are our treatment municipalities. So these, these red municipalities here. Um, we're going to compare them to these blue municipalities, which are those where um, there was never uh, the main vector for the disease. So much more, much less likely to have uh, Chagas disease in those uh, municipalities. We're going to ignore these other uh, kind of uh, striped um, areas. I don't really have time to get into it, but they're going to be sort of ex excluded from the comparison because other things are going on there. So um, when we're looking at, uh, you know, adult outcomes uh, in the long run, we're going to use the IPAM's 10% um, sample of the 20 uh, 2010 Brazilian census and use a difference in difference framework. So we're going to compare, you know, across municipalities of birth, those treatment group and, and the control group, and then add on another difference. We're going to look at, you know, whether you were born, uh, excuse me, whether you were 18 or over in 1984 when spraying began. So you, you're not going to have any childhood years um, benefiting from this, this insecticide spraying program versus those who were children at the time spraying began. So, you know, the kind of the more years of childhood you have free from this disease, potentially the larger the effects might be. Um, so that's the interpretation. There's, for the econometricians out there, there's a new, there's diff and diff, new stuff. Anyway, we're incorporating all that new estimation stuff. It's very, yeah, I'm just going to call it stuff. Um, so the first thing we do is look at uh, adult monthly income, uh, and we split our results out by race. Again, because, you know, we, we think that non-white Brazilians would have been different, uh, more affected by Chagas disease than, than white Brazilians. And so on the left, you're seeing uh, the effects on incomes for white Brazilians. Um, th this is the log of income. So the interpretation is that, you know, on for these um, people who were children when spraying began, their incomes uh, rise by an additional 3.4% uh, if you're white. Um, but on the right, you're seeing the effects for non-white Brazilians. And the effects are more than twice as large, that the, the increase in incomes is 7.7%. Um, so we think that this is really nice evidence of, um, you know, uh, disease control having important impacts on racial inequality in a very highly uh, racially unequal society. We can also look at sort of inequality um, without respect to race and just kind of, you know, sort of the broad distribution uh, or the sort of the entire income inequality among the entire population and look at the interquartile range of adult income. So we're looking at the 
the, the, the income at the 25th percentile and the income at the 75th percentile and measuring how large that range is. The wider the range, the more unequal, uh, unequally income is distributed. And we find that um, you know, these results are kind of noisy, but um, there's basically a, a, the, the IQR of, of incomes uh, decreases by an additional 3.3% for those with more um, childhood years free of, of Chagas disease. So again, very much um, a disease of the uh, Chagas is a disease that really only affects poor people. And so when you uh, eliminate this disease, you're really pushing incomes up at the bottom end of the income distribution. We thought that, you know, maybe these effects are operating primarily through schooling. And there's definitely some, you know, increase in, in schooling among both white and non-white Brazilians. But, um, you know, we're seeing actually, if anything, slightly larger effects for white adults. Now, remember, you know, we saw twice the effect for non-white um, Brazilians on their incomes than, than for white Brazilians. So, you know, it, it, and schooling is probably playing a role, but it can't be everything that's going on here. Um, because, you know, it wouldn't explain that that 2x effect for, for non-white Brazilians. So we think this is suggestive that, you know, maybe these health effects of Chagas disease, the fact that, you know, your heart isn't, um, isn't pumping properly and, and that would affect your ability to work, uh, we think that's playing an important role. So we can't get at that, you know, directly, but we can um, look at um, Brazil's universal health care system, uh, known as SUS. Um, and, and look at hospitalizations and spending on hospital care um, for, for much, much of this period, and then uh, deaths as well um, by cause for, for, much, for a lot of this period. And so we're taking that original difference in difference setup, um, changing it a bit slightly with respect to time. So we're thinking that um, you know, these, these effects, uh, these chronic effects take about 10 years to show up. Um, so our, our pre-period is, is everything that's 10 or fewer years um, um, since 1989 when Sprang finished up. And then our post-period is everything 10 or more years uh, after 1989. And then we're going to layer an additional difference on top of that. We're going to compare basically circulatory disease, which is plausibly affected by Chagas disease, and um, you know, cancer and car accidents, everything else that's not related to um, Chagas. So just to get show you the results uh, in my last minute or so, um, what we see is this you know, much larger decrease in circulatory disease hospitalizations um, in these you know, post-period years in states that were more affected by um, Chagas disease prior to um, the, the control campaign. It's about a 17% uh, larger decrease. When we look at spending, um, the results are a little noisier, uh, but we still see, you know, basically a 14% decline in, in spending on hospital care. Um, sorry. Um, so it's, you know, uh, this is again, Brazil's universal public health care system. So potentially, you know, very non, um, very substantive economic impacts, um, you know, just from the, the, the federal government's perspective, because the, the government is the one paying for these hospitalizations. And then we can look at deaths. Um, so the medical literature here is super nonspecific uh, in terms of like, you know, when chronic Chagas disease shows up and then once you have chronic Chagas, at what point do you die from it? Um, so, you know, you can see basically right around 2008, you see this downward trend in deaths. We're sort of, we're keeping this, you know, 1999 year as the, the pre versus post um, distinction. So our, you know, our estimate isn't statistically significant, but you can really see, you know, in the last 15 years, uh, much larger declines in circulatory disease deaths um, than in, in other types of deaths. Um, we can do a cost-benefit analysis. Um, I'm not going to go through the details, but basically, um, you know, just from the, the expenditures on hospital care that were averted, um, there's a, a, a very, very substantial rate of return um, from controlling Chagas disease. So I'll, I'll just wrap things up there. Um, and, you know, sort of, I guess I, I started off by saying this is a very Latin American specific disease, but um, lots of, of these neglected tropical diseases have both acute and chronic symptoms. And so we still think we're learning kind of more broadly about, you know, global development and, and the role of these diseases um, in, you know, inequality and, and underdevelopment and things like that. So um, I'll leave it there, but thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Give me the floor to present uh, my paper on early time shock and later human capital accumulation. In urban and rural sub Saharan Africa, effect on school attendance and educational attainment. For this, I propose. For this, I propose the following outline. First, I present the outcome and the research problem, following the research objective, the methodology, the results, and the conclusion, and the policy recommendation. Education is a fundamental component of human capital, which enhances future well-being and economic growth. The literature indicates that Climate shock can be a major barrier to the acquisition of this element of human capital. The loss of production. There is many ways the uh, this effect come and are manifested by many ways, by many mechanisms. First, the loss of production and income can affect parental ability and preferences to invest in education. Second, the resource constraint can lead a selective resource allocation, which reduce human capital investment, learner learning capacity, and academic performance. Third, the nutritional and the deficiency and the prevalence infectious and parasitic disease can have lasting negative effects on children's health and cognitive and physical development. So, the resulting standing negatively affect learning skills and academic achievement. In addition to this mechanism, the destruction of educational health and road infrastructure and the social can affect academic outcome. In Sub-Saharan Africa, two out of ten children are stunted, and three out of 10 primary school age children are out of school. Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest human capital accumulation index in the world. In this region, more than 60% of the labor force is employed in agriculture, and 96% of the cultivated land is rainfall. In this context, Climate change can affect uh, human capital accumulation. The literature on uh, climate and education indicate that exposure to adverse weather conditions during pregnancy and early childhood has lasting effects on human capital accumulation. One strand of this literature are, have focused on specific shock experienced during a single period of childhood. In contrast to these studies, a few authors have focused on shock experienced during two distinct periods of childhood, pregnancy and the first year of, of life. We contribute to the literature by three main ways. First, we consider several stages of child development, conception, pregnancy, and after birth. That means the year before birth to age five. This allows us to take into account the complementary contribution of the different stages in human capital formation. Most previous studies tend to consider a single stage of child development, which implied that the input used in, uh, pro in producing skills at different stages of childhood are perfect uh, suitable. Second, we explore both the income and the health transmission mechanism of climate change on uh, school attendance and uh, educational attainment. In contrast to previous study, which have mostly focused 
on temperature or precipitation. Looking at the effect of temperature or rainfall individually does not provide a complete understanding of the effect of climate change. Finally, we examine how the effects of climate change vary by gender and the residence in a rural and urban area. The distinction by gender is particularly important to understand the mechanism underlying gender heterogeneity. Also, the distinction by residence allows, allow, allows us to understand the changes in socioeconomic status of individuals in a urban and a rural area. The main objective of this study is to analyze the effects of climate shock on human capital accumulation in sub-Saharan Africa. Specifically, specifically, we examine the effect of exposure to early climate shocks on school attendance and academic achievement. For that, we use two models, binary and ordered probit models. These models are estimated by maximum likelihood estimator. We use two types of data, climate and education data. The climate data are from a climate research unit at the University of East Anglia. And the education data are from Topiums International. Our sample composed with data from census and survey conducted between 1976 to 2016 in 11 sub-Saharan African countries. We restrict our analysis to children between the ages of 6 and 18 at the time of interview. And to countries with data on child deaths of birth. Our climate variable over climate condition during the first six years of child life. After estimation, our results indicate that warmer than normal temperature in early childhood lead inequalities in school attendance between boys and uh, girls in urban and rural areas. In rural areas, one standard deviation increase in temperature during the early childhood reduced the probability of school attendance for girls by 15% and for and for, for boys by 80 by 8%. This effect can be By the lasting effect and by the lasting impact of climate of shock on physical and cognitive development of children. Also, the excess heat during pregnancy can cause physical deformity, delay brain development, and lead to a range of central nervous system problems. We can add another factor. The selective research allocation can reinforce the inequalities in human capital formation. We also find that temperature shock affects less school attendance in rural areas. Our results indicate also rainfall deficit during the first six years of child life has negative and significant effect on school attendance. This uh, inequality, this, the, this gender disparities may from parental preferences or the volatility of income linked to rainfall shocks increase the, mar the marginal cost of girls' education and reduce their performance. Since girls can substitute for their parents in household tax. This, in return, reduce the learning time and insist parents to adjust the, the resource for, for girls. 
We also have found that temperature is, is a key determinant of that complete completion. Boys are half as likely as girls to complete at least one grade. The result indicates also exposure to positive reinforcer significantly increases the educational attainment of boys and, uh, and girls. In conclusion, our study found that early weather shocks can impede the human capital formation. We propose the following policy recommendations. First, the extension of crop insurance or social protection programs can ensure food security and income stability in the face of uh, weather condition. You know that in, in, in Africa, there is no social production to ensure for this uh, food security and income stability. Another policy recommendation is that educating pregnant women about the negative consequence of heat exposure is essential to limit the adverse effect of pre- and postnatal shock. And finally, provision of basic social services like water and electricity can improve health so that that will allow households to redirect their health for expenditure for education and the training. Okay, thank you to everyone. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nguyen. I'm a six-year PhD student at UW Madison, and I'm going to be on the job market. So your feedback would be welcome. It's really helpful for me as well. Thank you for inviting me into this nurture environment and friendly environment, and I'm so really it's an honor to be here. So today I'm going to talk about, I changed my title a little bit, um, talk about the persistent health effect of the Agent Orange and all the defoliants during the Vietnam War. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Vietnam War, come back to the history lessons. So the, it starts, uh, the U.S. consider it starts when the first uh, group of military advisors come to Saigon in, in the first day of November 1955. And it is a continuation of the first Indochina War and it ends badly in 1975. And this is one of devastating war in the 20s, uh, later part of the 20th uh, century. So if you think about this, 20 years of war in Afghanistan, the total casualty is estimated, I read. I read uh, somewhere it's about like 200,000. And this is underestimation of the total casualty of the Vietnam War is 1.3 million people. And its aftermath is horrible with a lot of things, including DOC exposure, right? Diocines were sprayed during the Operation Ranch Hands. The point is uh, to remove the foliage cover and to destroy the enemy rice field. So, right, it started from 1961, but it started picking up from 1965 uh, when the American troops land mass landing massively land in Vietnam. Uh, during the course of 10 years, they spray around like 20 million gallons of herbicide, including Agent Orange and other things. It has a terrible ecological effect, uh, including destroying forests, mangrove, which is really important for the ec local ecosystem and the Malaluka forest. I don't know what it is, I just go around and it's, it's, it's just like mangrove, but it's, uh, it's just fresh water. Um, the effect population by Jenny and Stephen Stone at uh, um, Columbia University is estimated like at least like 2 million people were uh, affected. So my research questions would be like, well, this Operation Ranch Hands has persistent how it's affecting Vietnam. Uh, of course, I don't have enough able to address the effects of um, uh, deocene freeze uh, defoliant, but at least we, we know that deocene are persistent organic pollutants. When it's got into our body, the half-life is around seven years, which means that it's good. It, you, if you want to get rid of 97% of the uh, herbis, uh, herbis deocene that got into our body, uh, it's need like around like 35 years, the same mechanism for uh, DDT, for example, and others, um, uh, organic, uh, organ organic uh, chlorine uh, 
pesticides also have the same uh, similar uh, half-life. Um, it has a serious health effects. If you think about the case of uh, short-term exposure to a large amount of leucines, think about the case of uh, Viktor Yushchenko, the Ukrainian uh, politician in 2004, and the long-term effects leading to all kinds of chronic disease. So uh, with the data, um, okay, I have 10 minutes. Uh, I'm using the, the work by Stelman and Stelman's. Uh, it has the location type, uh, how they, where they sprayed it, amount of defoliants starting from 61 to 71. It's better than the herbicide file at the National Archive because the one in National Archive only consists of the one from the 65. Um, and then the other data that I'm using is, is uh, from 2009 census of population and housing. It's available in IPOM, but I'm sorry, you guys don't have the um, commute level. So um, it's, it's collected by the General Office of Statistics of Vietnam. Um, uh, information here. Uh, the, um, sorry, I forgot your name. I write your name down. But the, the public health is... Um, is similar to one work that one presenter that's uh, presented before. It's about a cell report health issue, like whether they have difficulty in seeing, hearing, memorizing, and walking. So that's it. That's all I have. If this is a big data, that's why it's addressed. The problem with it is that it do not have enough information on migrations. Uh, it's only like, where were you three years ago or five years ago, something like that. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I want to skip it. So it points out that after the U.S. Army, uh, the U.S. military massively landing on Vietnam, the amount of herbicide story and herbicide uh, spraying in Vietnam start picking up from 1965. Uh, Asian orange is not the only ones. Uh, all of them, uh, from orange to green, all uh, have deocene. Uh, Asian white is doesn't have deocene, but they was used like some what uh, substitute for Asian orange. But the thing is that it doesn't do the exact job because what Asian orange destroy in days it took uh, in weeks it took Asian white like four months something like that. Asian blue is uh, arsenic. It's not a persistent organic pollutant. So we less. And then the one, one thing is that they spray with the fixed wing aircraft. Uh, it's fixed wing aircraft usually used for like a large scale. When you spray into the jungle, you need to spray a lot. Uh, the ground spraying helicopters, you, you only have a limited amount of herbicide. So it's usually spray around like fire base or uh, your old base or maybe communication line. So this points out that Asian white and Asian orange is like somewhat uh, Substitutes. On the other hand, Agent Blue is for destroying like grass or narrow leaf uh, plants, for example, like rice field or uh, grass. It's usually around like the fire base or something like that. That's why they use in the helicopters. Um, I'm going to skip this. So two measures, um, uh, the, 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 the exposure. I use the work by done by Stelman and Stelman, and then it's just like including within five kilometers. The point is that if the place... Uh, I adjust, I adjust the number of gallons spray around that area adjusted for the distances. Um, so let's think about the econometric model, right? The, the econometric model is just like a typical one start with the OS estimations, um, blah, 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 with like things. Um, and then the typical control variable, a sample is like the census 2009 with people like do not move in the last three years. And the problem with this type of study is the endogeneity issue. It's come from, so if you think about this, it's like, uh, it's like typical study that study uh, what exactly the long-term effects of war or something like that. We don't have enough data. Um, so what we do is study the persistent health effects. So after a lot of like um, one, it's, it's affect one generation, uh, one population, and then the next time frame is like, if they are not, if they are, they do move, but at the same time, they have enough people that stay around correlated with the last populations, then this, the, the effects will persist. And that's, but the problem is that the confounding factors, because uh, they spray the place is, is not random. It's basically like, for example, um, they are trying to, they say they spray in, in a military advisor, they say they're gonna spray somewhere like, uh, uh, they're not gonna destroy crop unless there was the military advance, um, advantage, or maybe they're trying to spray in the low uh, low population area, uh, and a lot of things. So one thing I, I, I try to do is that trying to 
um, looking at the difference between Asian orange and Asian white. So they are somewhat susceptible in the terms of spray patterns and stuff like that. But leucin does not exist in Asian white. So if the excess opportunity uh, exposure index is something as good as random, and then following the, um, the, the, the news estimation stuff by Boris Yasin, who's uh, just randomized the pattern and type between like agent Y and agent orange, and then control for the simulated exposure. So here's the result. Um, so in each of the uh, lines here, I have for every bird cohort, so I run the regressions within that bird cohort. So, so the, 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 the numbers we have here is like showing the estimations, the, the, the effects of one unit of exposures on the, that cohort, right? So which means that if you look at this, um, right now it doesn't have a meaning, just showing like how, 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 if, how the effects, how, how it's ranked. But I will translate it into something that we will understand later, uh, like the uh, standard error. So, for example, in here is like for one unit of uh, uh, exposures, uh, increase it's increased the chance of uh, having uh, difficulty in seeing. Like uh, for the like 1940 and 1944 bird cohorts is about like uh, about one percentage points, something like this. Um, and then you see that there was the effects. It started picking up when there was like starting from the cohort 70 or uh, 74 bird cohort. And then we have the same patterns with the hearing impairments and walking impairments, even though like it's not significant when people like um, after the, uh, in the 1945 and 49 bird cohort, I guess at that point, um, I mean, I mean, at that point people get old. So it's, it's everybody has some, problem, bad, uh, bad knee or something. So it, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, that's one of my explanations. Um, the same with the memorizing impairment, uh, because you think about this is like, is 1950, if somebody born in 1950, in the 2009, they're already 60 years old. So the other group is like, like, um, like 60 to 65 and 65 to 70s, they are really old in Vietnam at, at, for that point. So if we, effects like for one standard deviations, right? Standard deviation is around 3.8. So we multiply with that with all the things that's significant. Then, um, so for example, for the old group, for the oldest group, for the uh, visual problems, so it's one percentage points increase would be like around like 3%. Uh, one de standard deviation increase in terms of exposure is increased like the, about like more than three percentage points in terms of uh, 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 visual problems. And if we compare it to the population that live in the place that never been exposed at all with zero exposure, then it's actually, it's compared to the incidence, right? Uh, which be, it's around like 10%. So in fact, a one standard deviation is equal to the around like um, uh, from 10% to 25% of prevalence in the unexposed area. So uh, one thing, right? Um, there was something that I, I want to point out as well, is that there was two places I highlight here, is the Central Highland and the Mekong Delta. Uh, Mekong Delta is, has its own populations. Um, for example, this is the, 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 the middle one is the math that was has the old population from the beginning. Compared to the one in the Central Highlands is actually um, the same situation when uh, after the war, uh, actually, after the, the French colonized it, they uh, before there was no not the Vietnamese coming there, but after the Vietnam War, there was a massively Vietnamese people coming from northern part of Vietnam, other part of Vietnam, come to the Central Highlands. So the people living in the Central Highlands do not like they they do not expose the direct exposure to the DOC to the defoliants. Uh, so they they do not have the direct exposure. On the other hand, the kid that's born in after. Uh, 71, they do not have intergenerational effects because their parents are actually from somewhere else. They're not from there, they not grow up in there. So if we compare between those two, it points out that where the effects come from. So it has some international, uh, in, uh, intergenerational effects in the, the, like say for 1990 or 1994 group, even though it's small, but because they are really young, so we don't know whether it's how big it is. But for the group that was born during the war, it's actually showing that the people in the Mekong Delta has a very large 
it's even way bigger than the, the, the before estimations, but then the one in the central highland has not effect at all, which means that the most effects that, subs, that persist today is the direct from the direct exposures to the deal scene. We have the same patterns in the, uh, with the hearing impairments, with the walking impairments, and with the memorizing impairments. Uh, I think I'm on time. So, okay, um, so that sum up um, is the health effect of the defoliants persist decades after the war, and most of them come from the direct exposure. Some of them might come from the intergenerational effects, even though the effect seems weak right now. Uh, the limitations is actually come from the data that I cannot fix it because like the migration, people are moving around during the war and after the war about like uh, for relocations, about the new economic zones policy, something like this. Um, at the moment, I'm unable to treat uh, the finding the effects of the uh, defoliant free, uh, no, defoliants. Um, so it's going to be a, a, lot, a lot of work in futures. Thank you for um and I think, I think I'm, I just stop right now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation to present this work. And this paper was, uh, my name is Ercio Muñoz. I work at the Inter-American Development Bank. And this is part of my PhD dissertation that I uh, finished uh, last year. So the paper is uh, whether where you were born or the regions that you were exposed when you were a child matter for your levels of intergenerational mobility in education. So let me start by just kind of defining what I mean by intergenerational mobility. So of course, intergenerational mobility basically is the study of the relationship between the socioeconomic outcomes of children and how those relate to the, those, of, those of the parents. And in economics, uh, we have typically two concepts, the absolute mobility, which is, for example, whether you have more education than your parents, so it's a living standard kind of measurement of uh, just progress, absolute progress. And then the relative, which is how, what is your position relative to the, your peers and how that relates to the position of your parents relative to their peers. In the paper, I'm going to focus on absolute mobility. There are several indicators of absolute mobility. And the one that I'm gonna be using is going to be just the probability of children achieving a given uh, educational outcome conditional on that the parents did not achieve that. And I'm gonna be using census data from the 60s. So the particular measure is going to be likelihood of finishing primary education, given that your, the parents did not finish primary education in Latin America and the Caribbean. So let me, this kind of give you the motivating fact or a stylized fact, which is if you take all the censuses from Latin America and the Caribbean, from IPOMS International, then you take individuals 14 to 18, you link them with the parents, the ones that are coinciding with the parents, and then you compute the probability of finishing primary for those with, with parents that did not finish, and you map, you get these two uh, uh, maps. On the left-hand side, you have at the um, Province level according to IPOMS, admin one, and you know, on the right hand side you have at the admin two. And what I want to just show you here is that if you look at countries, right, you you're going to be you see that there is an important variability at these geographical disaggregated levels within countries. Let's say, for example, Mexico at the top, you can see there are places where the likelihood of finishing primary when your parents did not is relatively blue, so it's very, uh, so one out of uh, five or one out of four are able to finish. And then other places are very yellow, which is practically everybody finish. So then the paper is, so we take this as a given. And in the paper, what I do is, okay, what does explain this variation in intergenerational mobility across a space? Of course, here we have two possibilities. One that is just sorting, people are different, families are different, and they decide to live in different places. And that's why we see this variation. And then the other, the second explanation is this place effects, which is where do you live or where you were born matters for your outcomes. So there is something happening at the, re, at the geographical level that basically affects the education upward mobility. Of course, the distinction is important because it implies different policies, like whether you would like to move people from one place to another or whether you should focus on, on the regions. And 
what I'm going to do in the paper is I'm going to exploit differences in the timing of children moves across provinces and districts in the region to isolate regional childhood exposure effects. So here, I'm basically, I'm going to follow an approach that, that was used first in the US by Chetia and Hendren to study the role of place, and that then was applied in Africa kind of with a similar data. So I'm going to try to study whether there is this evidence of the effect of place on mobility. So that's it. What I'm going to present, I'm going to try to present kind of the main result of, of course, not all the details because of the time constraint. So I'm going to be using in the map, you saw that I was using all the censuses from Latin America and the Caribbean, but for the estimation of regional effects, I'm going to be using only 11 countries. The reason is that I'm going to use movers, so I need to be able to see where they were born, where they are currently living, and then how much, how much time have they been living in, this, in the current place. Um, then in terms of data, I, I, I use the IPOMS international data where we have information about residents uh, of the interview and the beer place. We have two administrative units, the provinces and districts. Um, there is, uh, as I was saying, this information about place of beer and the information about the number of years living in the current locality. So with all that information, I'm gonna basically divide the population between stayers or people who was born in a region and live in the same region and movers that are those who were born in a given region, but then live in a different one. I'm gonna use educational information. I'm gonna particularly use the information about uh, levels of schooling to, to, to basically identify who finished primary and, and the, for those with parents that did not finish primary. So if you take that information, you link individuals, then this is just how the kind of transition looks like. So on the uh, bottom axis, Basically, you have level of education by parents. So you can see that in this sample, when you pull all the 11 countries and the census available, you can see that uh, an important share of parents did not finish primary. And then for those who did not finish, you can see that basically there are uh, large chances that children also did not finish. Condition that parents did not, you know, that you have a uh, uh, high likelihood of not finishing. So this is just to motivate that there is an important margin if you take this kind of historical census, right? Of course, if you were to take the last census of, of some of these countries in the region, primary would not be a uh, relevant margin, right? Uh, so the empirical strategy, I'm gonna try to explain a little bit the intuition. So basically, let's suppose we have two regions, A and B, they have different levels of upward mobility. So of course, ideally, we will just randomly assign people to the different regions with different levels of mobility and see whether they, how that affects the individuals. Of course, that's not feasible. So what I'm, what I'm gonna do is to estimate the level of mobility using non-movers. So people who stay in the same region, what, are, what is the level of mobility of them? Then I'm gonna see what happened to those who move from a place with a given level of mobility to a place with a different level of mobility. And I'm going to compare individuals who move at different ages. So let's say if you become like the new region, so let's say you move at the age of one from place A to B, then I'm gonna to try to see whether you stay as the region A or you converge to the region B basically. And how that varies with age. That's the kind of intuition. If you wanna see in a plot, it's going to be the following, A and B. So then we're going to see the chances of finishing primary for each H of move. And then we're gonna map kind of the dots. So if people who move from A to B become like people in region B, then the point is going to be right next to the red line at above. But if the kind of convergence decreases when you get old, older, then you're gonna see this decline. And then at some point we're starting primary. So if you move kind of at, when you are 18, that shouldn't affect right, the, the chances of finishing primary kind of you're too old. So then we, we should see some, so like that's kind of the prior and what has been shown 
that happen, for example, in, in, in Africa and in, in the US with income. So in terms of uh, estimation, so basically this is just kind of the variable of interest, which is going to be the probability of children, right? Uh, finishing primary, conditional on parents that did not finish. B is beer cohort here, and R is the region. So I'm going to compute this for each region using the non-movers. So then the delta ODB uh, is going to be the difference for a given beer cohort between the destination, that's BD, uh, gamma uh, and the origin. So the, that's delta, right? You move from A to B, what is the difference in mobility between these two origin and destination? And that variable of interest, we're gonna use it in this regression where the dependent variable is a dummy variable, uh, individual I, household age, born indicate V that moves at H M from origin O to destination D. And one if completes primary, zero if not. And, and then we have some fixed effects like alpha M, for example, is a fixed effects for each age of moving. Then a fixed effects of origin uh, cohort, but the, the parameter of interest here is going to be the beta. And we're gonna have a, a beta estimate for each age of moving. Um, and interacted right with this delta ODB. So that's going to be the parameter of interest, which is how the gap between the place of origin and destination translate into your chances of finishing primary for those who, with parents that not, right? Um, let me go quickly. The, the, the thing here, of course, is that where to move is not random. So there is some indigeneity. So the assumption to to identify a causal effect here is that the selection effect doesn't change systematically between ages of move. So if you compare people who move with at when they were two, they are systematically not different than those who move at the age three. So parents are not choosing where to move, like fine tuning between the ages of the, chi of the children. If, if, you do, if you make that assumption, then you can separate the selection from the causal effect. Uh, this is just the delta. So people in general move to better places on average, but they also move to places with lower levels of mobility. And then this is just the, I don't have a lot of minutes. So this is just the main plot of the paper. So here you can see the, right, these dots, which is these beta coefficients at each H of move. And you can see these three segments, which basically say that uh, when you move very early, okay, there is you are very close to the level of the destination or you converge, then at some point when you move at the school age, this uh, rate, this beta start to decline. And then here we have a segment after the, the primary age, which, which you see some flat uh, um, or sort of flat, right? Uh, uh, set of points. And here, then you can identify the selection because one minute. Because basically, that shouldn't at that age that doesn't affect your probabilities. So, the main findings here is that there is an effect of place that decreases with age. The rate at which people converge to the new destination is on average 3.5 percent, which means that if you move to a place with higher levels of mobility, you catch up like 35 percent of the entire gap between origin and destination. Um, and then, so I find this sizable childhood exposure effects. I also find selection effects, which means that of course people who move, they choose better places on average and they are kind of, they have more chances even uh, before they move. And, and in the paper, I do other things to address endogeneity issues like, uh, well, I also recommend these effects at the using secondary education. I estimate these effects using within families, just comparing siblings that move. So families that with more than one children and they are exposed to different regions because they have different ages. And then I address the potential endogeneity using potentially exogenous migration outflows and instrumenting locations 
using the, the standard chip share uh, strategy. Uh, that's it. Thank you.